and welcome to our seventh episode of Logi Talk. Really excited to come back to you all today with a guest that embodies the meaning of creator from every angle. Today, I will be sitting down with Jaquel Knight. Jaquel Knight is one of the top requested choreographers in the business. He is known as the man behind Beyonce Knowles' single ladies put a ring on it video, which won him his first MTV Moon Man at the 2009 Video Music Awards for Best Choreography. The video also went on to win that year's MTV Video of the Year and BET's Video of the Year Award in 2009. He has lent his creative expertise to culture-shifting projects like Beyonce's Homecoming and Black is King and is the man behind the Shakira 2020 Super Bowl performance. Iconic. Megan Thee Stallion viral sensation body, her SNL and 2020 BET Awards performances, and the video for her chart-topping duet with Cardi B, WAP. Jaquel has brought numerous other projects to the forefront, recently working on performances with the likes of Kanye West and Marshmello, and has directed recent projects for Megan, Pharrell, Zara Larson, Ashanti, and most recently a Starbucks commercial with Chance the Rapper. He has done five major world tours and three Super Bowl halftime show performances, and his work has collectively accumulated billions of views on YouTube. Aside from his work, Jaquel operates his nonprofit organization, the Jaquel Knight Foundation, targeting community focused initiatives aimed to build, uplift, and inspire the next generation of artists. What also makes Jaquel incredibly special is that he is the first commercial choreographer to copyright his iconic dance moves. I'm eager to go deeper in his, into his story today because his, accomplish, his, his accomplishments say a lot but I think the man can say more. So to speak to all of you and to stop you from waiting any further, welcome Jaquel, welcome to Logi Talk. Thank you for having me, guys. <laughs> What's up, you guys? Hello, everyone, how's it going? <laughs> How are you? How are you? I'm doing well, I'm happy to be home. I'm feeling good, you know, it's a nice Tuesday. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling great, happy to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you. We're glad to have you. I think it's safe to say we should jump right in because people just heard a mouthful. Um, but I think you could say anything about yourself better than I can. No, that, <laughs> that, that bio you read, I was like, oh my God, who is she talking about? You're like, I've done a lot. <laughs> so Jaquel, I mean, today you're a world famous choreographer. But where were you born? Where were you raised? Where did you grow up? And how did dance even become a part of your life? Woo. I'm from a very, very small town in North Carolina by the name of Roanoke Rapids. Um, dance and music has always been a part of my life. My parents, my grandparents, every backyard function, every family reunion, every birthday party, there was always music, food, and people dancing, always at everything. I, and I always say, you know, I credit Soul Train as my first dance teacher right in the living room of my grandmother's. Uh, so there's always been dance and always been music. Did you know that your career would be where it is today? Did you think that you could make dance into a career? Initially, no. Dance was also not on my radar, you know, when I was thinking about careers and thinking about next steps after school. I always saw myself as being a music producer, you know. How can I be the next Pharrell Williams and make the best music tracks? I was a musician um, for a while. And then I'll say around the age of 15, 16, I was introduced to my first dance class and that absolutely changed my entire career focus. You know, from there I was like, okay, how do I become a professional dancer? Then I started to do my research. I was like, okay, then it's to be a choreographer, then it's to be a creative director, then a director, you know. Uh, so I started early out like planning everything and I hoped, I prayed um, for a career like this. Now I can say I did not, I did not see it happening as quick and as fast as it did. 
Yeah, I mean, you dreamed about being Pharrell and now you work with Pharrell. So I would say that prayer, I need a copy of that. Um, and <laughs> I think that moment that you realized that you wanted to make dance into a career really led you into the breakout moment, um, which was you being recognized as the creator and the mastermind behind, behind Beyonce's single ladies video. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to hear that story of the how you two crossed paths and how it all came to be. But I know that our listeners and our viewers would love to hear it straight from you today. Oh, Lord. So it was this thing. I was in L.A. I've been in L.A. at this point, maybe a year. I went to this audition that was for Michelle Williams. She was looking for background dancers for her debut project. Frank Gatson was the creative director at the time. And that was, I'll, let me say this, that was the longest audition I've ever been to. The longest combination you had to learn. <laughs> and I basically went through that to get to the end and for him to ask, can anyone freestyle, anyone have a vibe that they feel like we need to see? And I felt like I was this kid from the country, from the South, who had this cool, interesting perspective on dance and movement. So I gave my little two cents, did my little two step. And he was like, oh my God, what is that? You know, can you show Michelle? Um, so Michelle came later and then eventually from that, he gave me a call a few days after the audition and was like, hey, we really love your swag, your style. Can you come and teach us a few eight counts? Can you show us a few moves? And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll do that. Um, so we went through the process of doing Michelle's music video. I came on board as assistant choreographer, then moved on to choreograph the promo tour. And then after that, Frank was like, you know, in the next few months, I may have a really cool job for you. Um, stand by. And I was like, okay. You know, so I went back to doing my little hustle out here in big old Hollywood. <laughs> And a few months that went by, I was like, you know, maybe Frank forgot about me. Let me get some steps together. Let me show him some moves, what I can do now. Um, maybe he's working on a Beyonce project. You know, I'm not sure what's going on. And that same exact day, I got a call from Frank saying, hey, I have this Beyonce record. Can you fly to New York tonight? We cannot email you the song. You'll stay for a few days. She'll work with you if... If it works out, you'll stay. If not, I'll get you back to LA and we'll figure out what's next. And I packed my things, I got to New York. That morning, the following morning on the red eye that night from LA and the record was single ladies. And I didn't go back home. And I can say at that moment was the start, the switch in this career, you know? I remember shooting, I stayed in New York. We worked on the video for two weeks. Um, I flew back home. We continued to do the edit and get everything right. And then once the video sort of launched, that was like the launching pad of like this nonstop career that hasn't stopped yet. You know, the train has continued to go on and on and on until this very moment. Oh my gosh, it's like zero to a hundred. And then even before we get to how you felt, I just want to know how did you afford the ticket from where you were to New York overnight? Like, did you it just- me. You <laughs> 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 but um, no, that's, that's remarkable. And I can only imagine how you felt when you realized what you were walking into. At the time, you have no clue, right? You just yeah. know you're out here, you're doing something that you always wanted to do. You're giving your all. You're hoping that, you know, this can be the saving grace or something that changed your life. Yeah. And for me, it happened to be just that, you right. know, something that changed the entire course of who I, you know, eventually would become, you know, from that one opportunity. And I would just say too, just from chasing your passion, right? You knew you wanted to make dance a career and it, it just from hearing your story, even within those three months, 
you were still preparing for this opportunity. Didn't know what it was, didn't know how it was going to come, but you were preparing for it mentally, probably envisioning it, imagining it, and for it to happen is pretty, pretty cool. Just amazing, amazing. And from there, you've become a pillar. And I think I can even, it's safe to say, an inspiration to creators everywhere because you specifically identify as a BIPOC creator and you understand the complexities that come with that really intimately. So when your career took off, went from zero to 100, what are some of the challenges that you started to notice in the spaces that you were in being one of a kind? I mean, historically speaking, there's not many books. There's not really much history, much information on commercial choreographers or choreographers in general, you know, especially choreographers of color. I think the only choreographer I've ever knew about or heard about that, you know, I felt like we could find a book on or do some research and find, you know, quite a bit of information was Alvin Ailey himself. And for me, just at the start of my career, just from the jump, I always wanted to create a, a path where through this career, you know, start to do things that felt historic and that people would want to write about and people would want to talk about. Um, And from single ladies, I always wanted to wear who I was as a person and where I was from and how I was raised and how I love to eat and how food affects how you dance and move (laughs) and how where you from affect how you dance and move. And through that movement, you can inspire people and you can speak to people and it shows them so much about who you are. Um, Single ladies taught me so much as to how people receive you as a person, as a creative. So I made that oath to myself to always stand true to who I was and never kind of fade, fade myself to the back and build a career out of a facade. You know, everything that I do is super personal and it's from a real POV. Um, And I felt like we weren't necessarily getting that in the industry. I wasn't seeing that in the rooms. And so many times when people move to a place like LA, I always say on that flight over to LA, people make themselves up, they throw on their best gear, they speak their best talk, and they try to hide, you know, the country's lingo, um, the fact that they love fried chicken, you know, because you know how LA is. (laughs) And... You know, you start to become a different person, but they're losing that that difference, that uniqueness is the exact thing that LA needs and the world needs. And for me, that was always something that I wanted to make sure that was extremely important to me and made sure I showcased through my art. Yeah, when I hear you speak, I think about you're from the South, so I think about soul food and it's like you didn't lose the soul in your food. <laughs> And your food is the work that we're all consuming and we're able to really celebrate and vibe to and everything that we appreciate about your work is your soul. It's it's you staying true to yourself and being authentic. Um, and you talk about all these things that are very personal. And so it leads me to think about your foundation, the Jaquel Knight Foundation. And it seems like all these challenges may have led you to create that for other creators. So can you tell us more about what that foundation is, what the mission is, and what you all do for creators everywhere? The foundation, Jaquil Knight Foundation, is basically built on my self-values and my mission statement for myself. You know, the idea for the foundation is to and inspire, encourage, and impact communities, especially those of minorities and in small towns, you know, to start to build a community and allow them to see themselves in spaces where they're not seen. Um, That's how I felt. That was me. You know, the boy from the small town who, who never knew you could be on TV, who never knew 
um, you can have the phone numbers of all of your favorite artists. You know, that was something that I never dreamt of. Um, so now the, the foundation is to show people you can do it all. You can dream it all and you can have it all. Um, and most recently, the foundation within its launch, we also took on the task to continue to uplift dancers across the country. Um, with the start of the pandemic, we raised over $200,000 that went back into the pockets of dancers across the country. Um, we fed them, we gave them money, we inspired them, we kept the community still excited, looking forward to get back, getting back to it. And for me, that's so important because it, it's so hard being a creative person in the industry. Um, people see the lights, the glamour, but they don't see the rejections. They don't see the no's, the thank yous. Um, they don't see you sharing room, sharing a room with five other people. They don't see you, you know, eating oodles and noodles every day. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's hard out here. <laughs> there. So, you know, the foundation is really to inspire those that look like me, those who really want it, want it so bad and just don't know where to start. Um, so technically it's to give back to those who look and feel like myself. That's amazing because I don't I don't think many people understand how creators suffered a lot during the pandemic, but we're still creating. Mm -hmm. They weren't getting paid for their creations though. They were just no. doing it um, to inspire people and to get them through a really hard time. Um, and we're pretty undervalued. So it's phenomenal that your organization could notice that and go back and fill that need through mm -hmm. philanthropy. Um, and you talked a little bit about rejection and I'm actually curious because of your, because of your foundational upbringing through the industry and maybe not having that quote unquote formal training that most dancers and choreographers get, did you ever get questioned about that at any time? Or do you feel like people really just saw your gift and latched on to that? Just like anything, I always feel like when someone's moving into a space and disrupting the space, you know, I felt like that was a very clear, like, formula of choreographers and work that we were seeing happening at the time, you know, and led by some of my favorite people, some people I call really close friends and mentors. But it was very clear who was doing what, when they was doing it, how they was doing it. You can tell from the work. And I think for me... At once I started, you know, so many people was like, how is this young kid doing this? You know, he knows nothing. You know, what is this? What is this mess? You know, <laughs> everything. Uh, people was leaving the agencies. You know, he's taking our jobs. You know, but once you start to understand there's only one you and there's only one person that can do what you do, that can speak how you speak and... I start to find encouragement through that, you know, not really let the negativity or the the pressure of it all get to me, but start to really dive into, you know, this is my journey. This is my story. This was meant to happen. This was meant to be, you know, this was ordained from God himself. Right. You know, so who am I to question? Who am I to say, you know, I shouldn't do this. Who am I to listen to the nun sayers? You know, I really found um, love and hope and, you know, guidance through knowing that my voice was special and unique. So through the no's and through the rejections and through the hate, you know, there was always like, boy, keep going. You got this. Keep doing you. Talk your, talk your junk. Oh, no, brother. Ooh, don't get me started up here. I mean, I, know, I think we could <laughs> all feel the word you were going to say. Genuinely, we could all feel it. We know. We know. We know. <laughs> and, and through that perseverance, um, it, it, it leads me to go to another part of your journey that is pretty incredible that we have not talked about yet. I touched on it earlier, and it's about being the first choreographer to copyright your own moves. So you started a foundation, and then you said, I'm going to go one step further and pave the way for so many creators and for myself at the same time and copyright my own dance moves. Please tell us the importance of that. And what even put that thought into your mind? 
Oh my God. Again, back to me. <laughs> back to me being the kid who literally never saw himself in the space. I love, I respect so many people that have come before me and I have so much respect and so much love. And now I can't, I mean, we all know their work. And for me, I just feel like the people that I fell in love with have not had that proper flowers handed to them. And it goes back to, you know, we all say like, what does it mean to be an American, right? Like, what's the goal, you know? And that's to have a piece of the land, to have ownership in the land. And for me, my land is the dance space. It's the dance world, it's choreography. So to know that nobody that I looked up to owned, had ownership in some of the most iconic works today, you know, was mind blowing to me. Especially in the industry where we're seeing songwriters and music producers be able to go off and build three houses, custom houses, have 10 cars, you know, make uh, millions and millions of dollars off their impact and their creative work. It didn't make sense for me that choreographers weren't seeing that same um, thing. So through that, it was always, how do we have ownership of our work, especially in the commercial space? And I'm not the first choreographer to copyright, um, but more so, again, in the commercial music space I am, because there are fields out there like Broadway, like the theatrical space, like the concert space, you know, these choreographers, they build their companies and their works belong to them and they make great money off sharing their work and putting their works on different companies. Um, but for some reason here in music, the wild, wild west of it all, you know, we were being skipped. Um, so for me, it's just a time for change. It's a time for change and it's a time for everyone to respect the choreographer and the work that goes into and knowing the impact that the choreography has on culture, especially now moving into a more visual world due to the likes of Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, we're seeing dance everywhere. So why aren't choreographers, you know, being properly compensated and credited even? So for me, it's a start of a change that I feel is needed within a community that gives so much to the world. That culture part is so important because I, th I think what many don't realize is that, correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't have your moves copyrighted, someone could take it, use it in a TikTok, an Instagram, in their movies, um, anywhere really, and not credit you at all, but profit from it. Oh, look, you're exactly right. You know, um, I mean, single ladies, for instance, we were seeing it everywhere from SNL to Sex in the City, the film, to Alvin and Chipmunks, you know, um, and not for one second to anyone say, you know, let's go to the creators of this, you know, ask if it's okay, you know, but they were asking permission to use the song, but for some reason, you know, we don't feel the need to ask choreographers, you know, permission to use their work. Yeah, and this happens to creators all the time because when I think about single ladies, I'm in the club and I can automatically put my hand up and do the movement but I would never 10 years ago think someone actually sat down and created this. I would just automatically say, no, Beyonce just dreamed it up in her head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of work that goes into creating, you know, um, as all creators, you know, there's a lot of work, it's a lot of passion and, you know, it's just time for change. It's time for change. Yeah. And from a high level from a high level view of copywriting your dance moves, I know there's a long process, but is it a video format? Is it a written format? Can anyone do it? Um, anyone can copyright their work as long as the work is in a tangible form, you know? So it has to live on TV, on YouTube. It has to live in a public space um, where everyone can have access to it. And then from that moment, you're able to copyright your work. Okay. If then you go through the process of dealing with the copyright office, which is so out of date. Um, 
and we're actually in the process of helping them, you know, catch up to the times. But um, then you have to make sure your work is, you know, considered. It's the right length of time, right sequences of steps okay. and so forth. Um, but it has to be seen in a tangible form that other people have access to. Okay. And does copywriting, do you think that helps protect creators? Do you think that's just the first step? Do you think that's all there is? Or is there something that the public needs to do to really help protect creators? Ultimately, as creators start to know that we have the power and we do have ownership of everything that we create, you know, and why, why give it away? Why sign any paper that says we no longer have ownership? <laughs> you know, that doesn't make sense to me. So I think it starts with us as creators that knowing we have the power. We have the um, right to control the situation. Right. And then from there, yes, we should all have our stuff copyrighted, you know, especially when it's when we're in a world where your work is to go and live on, live on far beyond our years. You know, I, I'm always creating works that I hope can live far beyond the time now I'm here on this earth, you know, and with that, as, as the work goes to live on, I hope my family is compensated for it, you know, um, and I hope the next creator who's creating something that's life changing and the world wants to do, you know, I hope they're getting compensation forever for it. You know, um, it's something that we absolutely deserve, deserve to have. In the words of Oprah, you get a copyright, you get a copyright, we all get a copyright, everybody gets a copyright. And that leads me to think about a surprise collaboration that you did with Logitech for Creators not too long ago. Um, I want everybody to know about that. You partnered together to award some outstanding creators with the opportunity of a lifetime. And I, I would love if you could tell everybody the details of that. Yeah, shout out to Logitech. You know, let me just say this. Everything we've been doing has been super awesome, super life-changing, and really, it's really awesome to connect and align yourself with a company that speaks to who you are as a person and have the same values that I have for my company. So shout out to Logitech again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, with this surprise during the month, uh, Logitech Celebration of Creators of Color, we were able to, Logitech was celebrating me, but of course I'm always got to do something for someone else. Um, we surprised um, eight creators, six creators at the time, I believe, and we're looking to um, do a total of 10 creators with copyrights of their work. Um, that's from some of the most important things that got us through last year, quarantine and the pandemic, um, from the likes of The Savage Dance yeah. um, by Kiara, The Savage Remix by yeah. the Nanny Twins, um, Young Deji, who created The Woe. Yeah, um, those were um, some pretty big... I'm, I'm even remembering the TikTok dances as you're saying them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it was so special because, you know, they all thought they was invited to, you know, be part of this night to celebrate me. They had no clue that we would surprise them with their work copywritten, you know, and yeah. given to them. You know, so it was so beautiful, such a beautiful night. And I must say it's the start of some of the most awesome things that we're planning to do together. And it sounds like they were just surprised. Did any of them, were you able to sit down and talk to any of them and really ask, how is this going to change your life? How is this going to change your future? I mean, you know how it changed yours. So I'm curious to just hear some of the reactions and the sentiment that you heard in the room. I mean, they couldn't believe it. Never in a thousand years they thought it would happen. And how should they, how would they? You know, we haven't seen it. Um, so they were beyond thrilled and excited and like so surprised, but it's these things that start to help change how we view ourselves as creatives. And it was so important to me and it meant so much to them that, you know, moving forward, we start to build a world where we value, truly value ourselves and the things that we build. And I think this did that for them. I can just imagine being a creator and you see your work on your timeline repeated and your name or 
none of your likeness is mentioned at all. Um, but you're just seeing it flow through society and make a cultural shift without any recognition at all. So you're right. This is a first. Um, and it also, it also lends to the power of support. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering why is the report, the support that you receive and that you've given back tenfold to other creators? Why is that so important? Support is so important, especially being a creator, especially being <laughs> a creator of color, is that it's, we're, we're all we have. You know, there's no, there's no handbook, there's no manual that says, you know, this is how you make it, this is how you go and get it, this is how you fall in your bag. You know, there's none of that out there. You know, we're out here doing it simply because of the love and the passion for it. And imagine if no one ever told you good job or no one ever said, you know, I got your back or I see you or, you know, I'm here if you ever need anything. You know, those little word, words can go such a long way. Um, I remember when I was first starting out training uh, and the choreographer at the time, Rhapsody James, um, it was just her simple words of, I see your heart, never give up. You know, that's why I'm here today. You know, just from those words of like, I see your heart, I see your passion, I see your drive. You have something, don't stop. Don't let these people change you, keep going. You know, it was those words that has pushed me um, to continue to elevate, to continue to try to change and shift the narrative and create a narrative that impacts and inspires others around the world who's um, doing the same thing that I'm doing, you know, that's following the same path or creating their own path, you know? And when you're creating your own thing, it gets lonely and it gets dark and it's okay to see a little bit of light here and there. I can testify to that. And you're talking about someone go else giving you inspiration so you can inspire the mm -hmm. world. And um, that does give me chills because as a creator, as somebody who is in a space that no one has laid the blueprint for, just the simple support of a company or another creative or someone who could give you an opportunity seeing that light in you, um, that's really the fire that lights all fires. I, I don't know how else to explain it. Um, and speaking of inspiration, it makes me think about innovation and it makes me think about how crazy it is to be in your world where people are calling you left and right, asking you to do this and that. How do you stay inspired? How do you keep it fresh? How do you keep it new? When do you even have quiet time to come up with dance moves if you're on a plane all the time? I think the main question here is how do you stay inspired and how do you stay innovative in a crazy, chaotic, creative space? Um, it's been difficult, I'll say, the past year, you know, since we're not able to travel as much, um, not wanting to travel as much, really. Um, but I never allow myself to lose who I am. Again, it goes back to everything that my values and who I am is built on, you know? Everywhere I go, where no matter where I am, I make sure there's time to go out. I make sure it's time to spend with locals, to see how they're moving in the clubs, to see what they're dancing to. Um, thankfully, Instagram and TikTok, you know, we're able to swipe and um, scroll all day and see, you know, what's happening across the world right. and even connect and say hello and good job. And I see you over there in Africa, y'all killing it, keep it up. You inspire me. Um, being able to do those things is really keeping me grounded. You know, it's about staying grounded and beyond the art, you know, making sure I spend time with my friends, with my family, making sure I allow time to cook um, allow, allow time for me to, you know, make sure my mind, my body and soul is all aligned and in tip top shape. Um, those things are really important to keeping the fire and allowing yourself to have longevity. It's been 14 years of this plus for me. Wow. And I'm always saying I'm just getting started. You know, this is the beginning of something's very special to me, you know, the start of a beautiful legacy. And I take it very serious. Mm -hmm. And without having those fundamentals and that foundation of like staying grounded, 
not losing who you are, not losing yourself in the journey of it all, you know, is really what keeps me inspired and allowing myself to be open to grow and create things that's new and fresh and different. Yeah. Cheers to 14 years more. And I think that you touched on global inspiration for your design, which is something that um, we really identify with closely here at Logitech. It's like we're always looking for inspiration globally. And I love that we both align on that. I love that you mentioned Africa. I love that you mentioned other places that you're looking to for inspiration. Um, And also just doing things that you love, self-care, the club. Like I, I love, I love it. I love, I, I love that you can stay true to yourself and find time for those things because you know that that influences your art. Um, and again, I think that's why, that's why our company and you are so in sync. Like we just, we, we feel your passion. We want to feel it. <laughs> um, and, And what type of environment do you think we can all foster to help creators feel that? Like, what do you think people can do better that can help encourage that type of behavior and creativity in people? Again, I believe, I truly, truly believe it's as simple as what we just spoke on, you know, lending your support any way possible any any way possible you know saying good job you know liking a photo uh, re retweeting a photo you know buying some artwork um watching a video watching a short film um anything attending a dance class right. you know all of those things go so far as to showing support which essentially encourages the artists you know and i think we have to build up the creatives in our communities um, and know that they are loved Mm -hmm. and we're here for them and we will continue to support them as they grow um, and start to become who they truly are. You know, it's such a learning curve and it's hard to, it's hard to be yourself and it's hard to step into big shoes for you, you know, and as we all go through that process, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I see you keep going, do Mm -hmm. it, do it big. You know, and if we can ever, however we can support, you know, that goes such a long, long ways. Yeah, yeah. Doing more than um, participating, but appreciating the pulse of the Mm -hmm. culture, because that's really that's really what it is. How do you want to see your passion for dance disrupt the status quo and bring people together? I think you spoke to that broadly, but um, it seems like everything you do from your foundation to copywriting your own moves um, to giving back in times of need and to even partnering with bigger brands that want to do the same. It seems like you're just trying to disrupt the qu- the status quo as much as you can. And um, I really want to hear from you, like, how, how do you want people to view that? How do you want to keep doing that? For me, I just hope it inspires the next me, um, the next young kid in the South, in the country who all they have is their iPhone, all they have is YouTube, and to know that you can do it, you know, push the boundaries, push it, you know, even if 100 people tell you no, go for it. If you truly feel in your heart that you can do it, do it. And I hope that's what people remember me from, you know, is continue to elevate a space that they've put in a box and to break the box and to allow the box to become a a flat plane, you know, for me to run and jump and skip and dance on. You know, um, I'm always challenging myself to live in a world that's uncomfortable because I think through that uncomfort, I'm able to do things that I wouldn't do otherwise, you know, continue to push myself for for um, something different, for a different outcome, you know, that I would hope then shape culture for it to be better for all of us in the end. That's my goal is to continue to shake, shake it up, shake, shake it up. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so we can wake it up. Shake it up so we can wake it up. Shake it up so we can wake it up. I like That's that. Cool. I like that. It probably belongs on a shirt. I'll I'll copyright that and I'll credit that to you. Wait, we gotta split it. Yeah, baby. So we can wake it up. Um, I will never forget that. <laughs> uh this was such a uplifting conversation and it's hard to like even want it to be over to get to the end because I think there's so many questions I just want to sit in a room with you and pick your brain but I can't do that because you're on a plane all the time so um (laughs) before I let you go um I always ask every creator that comes on I always ask them because you talked a lot about what we believe in here at Logitech which is defying logic and really going against the grain and following your passion and I want to know what defying logic means to Jaquel Knight. Defying logic is to continue to break barriers um, for your space, for your world, for yourself. Um, continue to break the box that they've placed you in and to think outside of it. Reimagine the box. How good does the box look? How can the box work for you? That's defying logic. It's creating a space that allow us to think freely and be able to fly far, far beyond our mental capacity and create a world that's just as beautiful and just as groovy and saucy and seasoned as we would like um, that allow us to be our true selves and to thrive and to live in that freedom. Wow. <laughs> it was the seasoning for me. I felt that. I felt that very, very deeply. Okay, I lied. One last thing. Usually, everybody that comes on, I always play a this or a that game, and it's uh-huh. really, really fun. <laughs> he said, uh oh. <laughs> it's really, really fun because it always has to do with what they do. Um, and for you, I think videos speak to the culture. You have changed the pulse of a generation with your dance moves. I don't know if anybody can go right now as you hear us talking and look up the amount of videos that you have worked on, but I think they would be shocked to know how much of your hands and your body and your head has been involved in the last 10, 15 years of culture. Um, And so that brings me to wanting you to pick out your favorite moments and videos, and I'm gonna pit them against each other. And you can just tell me why you're picking the one that you're picking. We don't have to diss all the my other babies, one. All my babies. I know, so we're, we're gonna apologize to all the big names before we start this, this and that game. Say your apologies, cause you're gonna have to pick one. Oh, so baby. I'm a fan of both of these ladies, um, Beyonce and Shakira. They both, you had a you had a hand in both big live performances that they did. Um, so the first one is Homecoming for Beyonce. I saw that at Coachella and it was remarkable. <laughs> and the second one was the most talked about Super Bowl performance I think of the past ten years. Shakira's Super Bowl performance. You had a hand in both of those, but which one did you love the most and why? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like I was, re- I, I knew, I knew your reaction was gonna be this, but it's good. It's nice. It's fine. Sorry, Beyonce. Sorry, Shakira. We love you both. <laughs> Let me say this: they <laughs> <laughs> both of those performances are like the epitome, like of who I am as an artist, and they did just that. They spoke to cultures and communities that did not see themselves on TV and allowed those people feel celebrated, okay? Um, And okay, now that that's out of the way, I'll have to say (laughs) homecoming, you know, it's something about all the black kids at HBCUs um, to know that it's okay and you are lit and you're special and keep going um, because you have something. You have something that this world needs. And I think Homecoming did just that. It spoke to a 
a generation of people who just needs the love. Um, and that was really, really, really super special to me. Oh, I love that. I cried at that performance. It was remarkable. Just the optics and anybody who hasn't seen it, please go look up Homecoming. I'm sure it's on YouTube or um, online somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable imagery and amazingly put together. And there's a story behind it as well. Um, okay, next. Both of these went viral. Megan the Stallion's body or Cardi's wop. I mean, they kind of like, they, yeah, they both went viral. They both were very popular. These are both strong female rap artists. But which one did you love the most and why? I know I'm giving you hard ones. I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'll say body. Oh. oh. I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> oh, my God. I'll say body. Oh, okay. I'll say why. Okay. I'll say body why. Okay, why? Just why? <laughs> Just go into the why. <laughs> the why feels better. <laughs> Uh, the, <laughs> oh my I'll say body because okay. body really beyond the dance beyond um, I, they're both beyond the dance you know what body did was made everyone feel good right you right. know regardless of your race your size your yes. ethnicity where you were from um, your sets, you know, everyone felt like their body was it and yeah. it felt yeah. needed. So um, for me, body, I'll say body for that. I love your why, because that's so true. Like everybody felt so accepted by that song. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what you looked like. You just were like, it's my body. And I mm -hmm. can use it. I love that why. I love that <laughs> why. Okay, two more for you to cringe through. Um, <laughs> both of these were part of like the female revolution of the past decade. So we talked about single ladies earlier. I'm going to put that up against Diva. Both are by Beyonce. Uh, you can kill me later. It's fine. This I'll say single ladies because I think single ladies was the start Diva is like the step, the not stepchild, but the child of single ladies. You know, okay. single ladies is the our first sort of idea at creating this world of movement that um, we haven't seen on TV at a time. You know, which yeah. you know they call J setting, they call bucking, but you know with that dance style, you know the idea of that we really started to create this narrative, you know, from single ladies down to homecoming, you can sort of see this vibe in the way that Beyonce danced and the way we were allowed, allowed ourselves to move and find freedom mm -hmm. and a power in it, you know, that was oftentimes just forgotten about, you know? Um, so I'll say single ladies for that. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with everything you said. Everything you said. Um, last one, be both of these shifted cultures. I think you could tell already how much I love Beyonce, but don't we all? Um, these two shifted culture just based on social movements, and they really focused on race and ethnicity, and they were songs that were made for a specific group of people. Like, it brought a lot of controversy, but it also brought a lot of pride with it. So I'm talking about formation or your work on Black is King. Both of those, no. that, I mean, that album, if anyone goes and checks out the visual of Black is King, you will understand what I'm talking about. And wow, it pulled uh. from everywhere. And then formation was pure just blackness at its finest in every single way so you i know it's gonna be i'm sorry jaquel oh uh, gabby <laughs> <laughs> um i was oh uh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. The why feels say, better. Um, the why feels better. The why the why feels better. I'll no. say um 
the waff of both of them is so good too. It's like I don't want to pick, but <laughs> again, I'll say formation because I feel like Black is King is like the formation is the first child of like this era of being unapologetic, mm. you know. Um, and with formation and that whole like project, we were. Black, 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 oh, black, yeah. black, 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 as we could be, you know, and and that led to, you know, what is the work of Black is King, which led us to Africa back, back to the land of blackness, you know, um, the the core of who we are, you know, um, so which was beautiful and allowed us to connect with the motherland and be a part of the conversation and give respect and just do and credit to so many artists in the space that have, you know, created some of the things that we love so much from the music to the dance. Um, but I'll say formation for me, is like the, the, the first child of like this new era of like standing up for who you are and being proud of who you are and not really giving two Fs about what anyone have to say. Love it. You know? Love it. Oh my gosh. See the why it feels so much better. You made it through the game. <laughs> you made it through the game. Um, Jaquel, I want to thank you from Logitech, um, but I also want to thank you on behalf of the culture. You've changed it, you've shifted it, you've molded it, and you've inspired other people to do the same. And so um, this is just a celebration of you and a thank you times a thousand for all that you do and that you continue to keep doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and it's that, those things that really keep me pushing, keep me going. So absolutely, thank you. absolutely. We're all very inspired by you. And I know we're going to keep seeing you shine. And we're going to talk soon when you get off your next plane. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Bye, you guys. Bye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining Laji Talk today as we continue to recognize the people who are pushing boundaries to inspire and change the world. This series is going to continue to share the stories of trailblazers to help inspire a new generation of creators and activists. So make sure to stay tuned for more. See you next time.